Comfortably seated, please find in your Bibles John chapter 3. If you don't have a copy of the Scripture uh, today, there are plenty of Bibles around the room. So if you look around you see somebody doesn't uh, have a Bible, open it to John 3 and hand it to them so that they can see from the Word of God uh, what the Bible says. You know, it's really important to have this book, isn't it? Because, you know, God is the only person who doesn't change. And uh, God's Word is like Himself. It also does not change. You know, it's uh, a distinctive of this church. It was something, if you say, well, Pastor, what's different about Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church uh, than some churches? Well, we may not be different in this way from every other church, but what we believe about the Bible kind of sets us apart from a lot of people. See, many individuals believe the Bible's a good book. But they believe that it's a book that's written by man, and they believe it's a book that has mistakes in it. And we don't believe that. We've looked at the Word of God, we've looked at what it says about itself, and we've realized God has revealed Himself in His Word, and in His Word He promised that He gave His Word perfectly. If you believe in God, I think that would include all of us, wouldn't it, today? If you believe in God, uh, then you certainly believe in the supernatural. Right? If you believe in God, you also believe in creation, don't you? We read in Psalm 19, Romans chapter 1, uh, and Romans chapter 1, that one of the ways that everyone in the world knows that there's a God is because of creation. Mm -hmm. And any person who looks at creation can see not only that there's a God, but the kind of God that He is. Or as a God that can make the world is not a God who's limited. He's a God who is able to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so we believe in God. And uh, the question is, okay, if everybody in the world knows who God is, how do you know what truth is? You get five people together in a room, and if you have them give their opinion about who they believe God to be, you'll have five opinions. You ever have somebody say something like this? Well, my God would, or my God wouldn't. And they tell you what the God, who is the God of their opinion, would be like. And as many people as have opinions, which is every person, that's how diverse <laughs> God would be if He were the God of your opinions. You know, it wouldn't be very fair or very accurate to describe you that way, would it? Would it be fair or accurate to say about you that whatever somebody has an impression of you about is true of you? How do you have people that have known you a long time, but you'd say they don't really know me? Or if you know people that would know you, uh, but maybe they're wrong about something they think about you. If we are to know God on the basis of who we think He is, then, my friend, most of what we think would probably be wrong. So how do we know who God is? Well, He tells us who He is in His Word. God used men to write His Word, and God was able, because He's God, to use men in a perfect way, and then He preserved His Word. Psalm 12, 6 and 7 put it this way. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And then... The Holy Spirit says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the Bible promises that, that God's Word is perfect, and it promises that it will always be perfect. It's eternally perfect. You know, there are some people that believe that God gave His Word perfectly, but then they believe something that is nonsensical in my mind. They believe God gave His Word perfectly, but that we don't have it in a perfect form. That is, there are mistakes in the Word of God. You know, it would be kind of silly for a God who could make the world to give us His perfect Word and not be able to preserve it, wouldn't Amen. it? The Bible Amen. promises preservation. Now, we're not studying that today, but I just want you to know <coughs> where we're coming from. Because the fact of the matter is that people change. Churches change. Denominations change. But God never changes. And so, if you believe His Word, it will always be the same. Amen. And so, that's what our authority is in our church. And... Uh, not only do I believe that, but I found it to be true as well. Mm -hmm. And the witness of the Holy Spirit shows that. Okay, so we're going to read a text today uh, that I think everyone's familiar with, hopefully. And as we read this text of the Scripture, I want you to pay special attention because I believe for many of us, this is one of the most helpful passages of the Bible for your entire life. Not just when you get saved and come to know God, but a passage of Scripture that causes you to be able to rest and what God has done, knowing that you know that you have eternal life. Okay, before we read, though, can I ask you a question? Do you have eternal life? Amen. In other words, it is an absolute certainty for you that you'll never perish, that you'll never uh, be God's enemy, that if you were to die, you'd never face God's judgment, but that God has given you eternal life. Hmm. 
If that's so, it's because you believe what's in John 3. But if it isn't so, then you can believe what's in John 3, and by the end of today, you can know that you have eternal life. Amen. Verse 16, let's look at it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. And we'll stop there and we'll ask the Lord to help us with our understanding at this time. We need God's help, don't we? God, please help us to understand your word. Father, some of the phrases, some of the ways things are written, Lord, maybe, maybe they're difficult for us. And uh, what we need is to be convinced that what your word says is true. But God, we need the witness of your Holy Spirit. So we ask for your Spirit's presence to be in this place and for you to speak to us not with my words, not with my wisdom, but God, with your word, and God, that you would just do so in a very convincing, real way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been preaching in the Gospel of John, and we're in a series where we're going through the entire book of John, and we have kind of gotten ahead of ourselves a little bit as we were introduced to John the Baptist, and we looked at the person of John the Baptist, and that was a good study, wasn't it? It's interesting that Jesus said about John the Baptist that... Uh, born of women, there was no prophet that was greater than John the Baptist. That's quite a compliment for a man. When I read that, I stop and I say, wow, what was so special about John the Baptist? And when I look at prophets, I, I think of supernatural things that God used prophets to do. I think of Moses as a great prophet, and God used Moses to lead the children out of Egypt. And what did he do? Well, he did miracles. God had Moses do miracles with his rod. He turned rod into a snake. And then, of course, God, uh, God gave Egypt plagues. But, I mean, the, the major miracles God used Moses to do, crossing of the Red Sea, two and a half million people. The fact that God's people, national Israel, exists today is because God allowed two and a half million people to pass through the Red Sea on dry land. And the same place that they passed through, then God closed up the waters and destroyed Pharaoh's army that would have killed them. That's a miracle. Amen. God's presence was with the children of Israel in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You cannot explain the existence of a people that, that go into a wilderness, a couple million people, for, four and a, or for 40 years. Uh, and and you, you just can't explain any other way than that God did what the Bible says. That God provided manna to fall on the ground, food, bread for them. That God provided quail, meat for them. That God caused their sandals to never wear out in 40 years' time. God used Moses to do great miracles. But when I think of, of uh, prophets and greatness, I mean, Elijah's the guy, isn't he? He prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed and it rained instantly. Uh, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to see who the real God was because the, uh, the, the Israel was worshiping, uh, they were worshiping idols instead of worshiping the true and living God. And Elijah prayed and what happened? Fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice on the altar, which was covered in water and had trenches of water around it. And that's a miracle. That's a pretty great miracle. Um, Elisha. You look at the miracles that God did with Elisha. Many of the prophets God used to do miracles. Jesus said that John the Baptist was a greater man than any of the prophets. What miracles did John the Baptist do? Never did a miracle. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said there was never a greater man than John the Baptist. And so we did a study for a couple of weeks on what greatness is. And I'm not going to tell you what it is right now. I'll just simply tell you that Jesus said that in the kingdom of heaven, there, the least person there is greater than John the Baptist. And God's word was trying to encourage us about what is in store for you as his child. Isn't that incredible? Okay, so you can go back and watch some of our series on, on, uh, online that, have, that you've missed maybe the last couple of weeks if you haven't been able to be here. Last week, uh, we went back and we looked at the gospel. Now, 
when we began our study in the Gospel of John, we drew a distinction between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are also Gospels, and John. First of all, let's review and let's remember what the word Gospel means. What's the word Gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Okay, when Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John share the Gospel, what is the good news? Should we say, who is the good news? Jesus. We could say, based on what all four of the Gospels concur, that Jesus is the Gospel. In other words, you can take any aspect of Jesus' life, and the person of Jesus is the good news to us about who Jesus is and how we can know God. But what is the difference between the Gospel of John and the other three Gospels? Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say this is who Jesus is, or this is who Jesus was. And John says, this is how you can receive Jesus and know that you're saved. All right, it's distracted us enough today. It's Tony's fault. So, Tony, glad you're here, so complain. You ruined the sound <laughs> again. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> it's not really Tony's fault, but he's just the perfect person to blame things on. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, I'll do my best. All right, so the gospel is the good news about who Jesus is, but John says this is how to know Jesus. Let's go to John chapter 20. And I, you say, Pastor, you've reviewed this every single week. Yes, I'm going to keep doing it, and my hope is that I'll review it enough that you'll know it. Amen. And that'll be the goal, okay? So John chapter 20 and verse 30, John gives his purpose in writing this gospel. Do you see it? Uh, the Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. Now verse 31. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. So what's John's Gospel's purpose? So that you can believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Christ. He's the God's Son. And that by believing that, you can have life through His name. So John's express purpose. You ever ask yourself the question, what's the difference between the other Gospels and John's <coughs> Gospel? Well, their Gospels say this is who Jesus is, and John's Gospel says this is how you can believe in Jesus. This is how you can receive Jesus. Now, a corruption of the teaching of the other Gospels to make, for instance, Matthew, when he shares the Sermon on the Mount, with, with, where Jesus is teaching His disciples. And to take what Matthew says, which is teaching disciples how to follow Jesus and how to be learners and how to be servants of Jesus and to make that how to be saved, well, that will corrupt the Gospel. And there are people that have done it. They've said, oh, you've got to, you know, if you don't do this and this and this, you're not saved. Well, how does a person get saved? We saw last week. A person gets saved the way that the people in the, the children of Israel in the wilderness were saved from death by being bitten by the poisonous serpent. How were they saved? They looked at the serpent that was erected in the middle of the camp, and anybody who was bitten by the poisonous serpent lived, and anybody who didn't look died. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is in John 3, even so, same way, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And that brings us to our context today. Now, I would just want to answer the question as simply as I can, and I realize it's time change Sunday. And so I'm going to try to answer the question as fast as I can. And that is, how can you know for sure that you have eternal life? Or we could ask the question first, can anyone know for sure that they have eternal life? Many times I've encountered individuals that I haven't had the opportunity to speak with before, and I've asked them the question, do you think that you have eternal life? Do you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? You're going to be with God rather than uh, be God's enemy and be judged by God. And many people say things like, I think so, or I hope so. And then you ask them, well, how do you, how do you know? How can you know? And most people would, if they would honestly confess that based on their opinion, you can't quite know for sure. I've heard people say this. You ever heard this? Nobody knows for sure. Mm -hmm. You ever heard somebody say that? So well, that isn't what Jesus said. Uh, and, and then you ask them, well, how can you know? Well, some people say, well, it's based on what you do. And so some people think you have to live out your entire life. And uh, based on how you actually live, then in the end, God's going to judge you. And He's going to take, a lot of people put it this way, they say, well, you know, it's like a scale. It's like a balance. God takes your 
good works on one hand, and God takes your bad works on the other hand, and then God weighs it out, and if your good works outweigh your bad works, then, then you go to heaven. But if your bad works outweigh your good works, then you go to hell. And some people don't like that you go to hell, so then they make up like an alternative. Well, then you go to a place where you're purified, you know, and where you're punished for your bad works, but you're made a better person, and so forth. And uh, the problem with that teaching is that it contradicts the Bible. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says about sin, the wage... We know we've all sinned, don't we? That's not an argument, is it? Not, not with rational, sane people, I don't think. But then the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And when we realize that judgment is not for good, but judgment is for evil. You ever been pulled over in traffic for keeping the speed limit? Or for wearing your seatbelt? Or for having all of your brake lights, tail lights, and turn signals functional? Coming to a full, complete stop before proceeding with caution? Has anybody ever been pulled over for that? And uh, been given a citation and sent to the judge? You know, I notice you used your, your turn signal the appropriate amount of distance before you came to the stop sign. You, you came to a full, complete stop and then proceeded with caution. Where did I learn that? That's, probably, that's like taking my test for driver's education, isn't it? You retain things you learn when you're a kid, not when you're old. Uh, but, uh, and then, you know, I noticed, man, you, you know, you looked both ways before you proceeded and you signaled appropriately. And so I'm going to give you a citation. You're going to go before the judge and you're going to get $200. Ooh, amen. Isn't that about what it costs if you do anything wrong, at least $200? Okay, so uh, what, what do you go before the judge for? You go for an infraction, not for something good. Yes. You know, this whole notion that we get judged for good, you don't get judged for good. Good is right, good is good, is good right? Good's commendable. Good doesn't have negative consequences. Uh, you do the right thing and you won't be plagued and your conscience won't be troubling you, keeping you up at night. You do right, you won't be looking over your shoulder trying to see if somebody's going to catch up with you and find out what you did. Good has its consequences, but good isn't what we're judged for. Evil is what we're judged for. Does that make sense? It ought to be common sense. It ought to be uh, what we all know. Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so eternal life is a possibility according to the Scripture. But eternal life is not because anyone is good because all have sin. So the concept of goodness or good outweighing bad or being more good than more bad is first of all uh, what I would call capricious and arbitrary. But secondarily, it's not even, it's, it's not even tangible. <clears throat> like, how do you really know? How can you have any confidence that your good is better than your bad? Well, I feel like I'm a good person. Yeah, but then why does the person that knows you best not feel the same about you? Or, you know, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, it, it's, it's kind of a sliding scale, isn't it? You know, are we measuring on a curve? I think a lot of people think that. Well, you know, compared to this really rotten guy, I'm pretty good. You know, and you can compare yourself with the right person. You seem pretty good. You know, I mean, I'm always available if you need a bad comparison. But the fact of the matter is, the reality of it is, is that we're not compared on a sliding scale. We're compared with God. Yes. We're compared with God. And the Bible says we've come short of God's glory. <clears throat> so that's pretty simple to understand, isn't it? Okay, our Scripture today shows us how we can know with absolute confidence, with full certainty that we're perfect and that we have eternal life. Seriously. So let's look. Let's look at it. Last week we saw that faith is what God requires in order for a person to be saved. And this week I want to just talk about biblical assurance, knowing that I'm saved. So if you'll gaze at verse 16 again, the Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We've all memorized that probably, haven't we? Most people are familiar with John 3.16. Or at least you've seen it on Tim Tebow's eyebrow paint. Uh, but verse 17, the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Now that's good, isn't it? How many of you are on the don't condemn people team? Some mean people in here. I'll tell you, the condemn people team. I don't want to condemn people. You know, the Bible says, With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And uh, with what measure you meet or you give, you'll be given to you. And my thing about condemnation is that there's plenty of it to go around. And so, I'm, you know what, I, I have to take the Word of God and I have to agree with what God says about people and about myself. That's not judging. 
But I'm not into judgment. And the Bible says that Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Now, there's a qualification to the statement because we all look at it and say, oh good, Jesus doesn't condemn anybody. Well, that's actually pretty well true. That, but what it says is not that Jesus doesn't condemn anybody. It says that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. In other words, many people, and Nicodemus, this man that, that Jesus is speaking to here, would be included in this, many people thought that God was going to send His Son to judge the world. Does this world need some judging? Today we read in Ecclesiastes in our teen Sunday school, and we read about oppression. And as I thought about oppression, I thought there are some terrible things that are happening in this world. Have you ever read about uh, the guy, is it Cooney or Coney? The guy in Africa uh, that, uh, that ensla basically enslaves children and makes them soldiers and uh, captures schools full of women, just does atrocious things. He's been at it for more than 20 years. And, uh, you know, you just think, man, somebody ought to do something about that. That's oppression. Do you ever look at some of the things, you ever just see the pictures, real pictures? I have, uh, I have uh, many Facebook friends from the continent of Africa, and many Facebook friends from Pakistan, and many Facebook friends from India, and they send me videos of things that are happening in their life, and friend, I just have to tell you, some of the things I can't watch, they're just terrible. They're just, I mean, they make my heart sick. They make me just, just sick to the stomach. I just can't handle it. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of oppression in this world. And somebody ought to do something. Are we agreed on that? Mm -hmm. Somebody ought to do something about evil. Um, I was talking to our teens about this. This is something Brother Anthony and I looked up this last year. We were researching abortion. And did you know that in the state of New York City, for every black child that's born, one is aborted and some? That's genocide, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, literally wiping out, a, wiping out an entire ethnicity of people. When I think about it, I'm telling you, my, my, my uh, skin's crawling right now just thinking about how evil that is. For every child that's born, one's killed. One's aborted. And that's just evil. And, and, and it's like the new morality today, isn't it? Like it's the platform, like we're good people, let's kill babies. I mean, it's like it's an entire party platform, isn't it? Yeah. Today, and, and friend, you know, say, Pastor, you're getting political. That's not political. We're talking about lives. And it's oppressive. And, it, and it, it's one of those things that is so bad, it's like you realize, man, and the law allows it, and it just seems like that is, that is the norm, and that's what everybody's thinking, and it's just evil. And this world needs some judging, don't they? And evil needs some condemning, doesn't it? And so here's national Israel. Here's Nicodemus who's an Israelite. And he's under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And the, and the Roman government has conquered the world and they're forcing uh, their way of life on people and, and uh, very unbending, very un, uh, you know, unmoving about it. And so Nicodemus thinks Jesus came to become a king and he's going to destroy the Romans. And he's going to destroy bad people. And that's what he came for. And Jesus said, I came not to condemn the world. I didn't come for that purpose. I didn't come for that purpose. Now we see something in the next verse, and that's that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. Yes. The world's already condemned. Condemnation doesn't change anything. The condemnation is already the reality. The Bible says in verse uh, 17, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Verse 18, he that believeth on Him is not condemned. But notice the next verse, or the next part, the next phrase. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What does it take for a person to be condemned by God? What's required for a person to come under condemnation? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you know when the world became condemned? When the first man sinned. Yes. That's when the world became condemned. What do you have to do in order to feel condemnation? What do you have to do in order to feel condemned? What do you have to do in order to become a sinner? Absolutely nothing. It's already done, already taken care of. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn anybody. The world's already taken care of that. It's already condemned. My friend, I have to say this. You may not like to, to think this about God, but God's already condemned the world. 
Condemnation has already come. In other words, nobody anywhere is getting away with or will get away with anything because God's already judged it. You know what's going to happen to evildoers, to the wicked? Will it satisfy you to know what's going to happen to the, to the wicked, to the evildoer? They're going to burn a lake of fire forever. Is that enough? Condemnation for you? Is that enough? Uh, think of the worst person in the world and think of what God's judgment for them already is. In other words, it's not like they're going to, God's going to decide later on what's going to happen. It, they're already condemned. The world's already condemned. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world from condemnation. That's the good news, isn't it? You say, Pastor, how could God be good and condemn anything? Well, how could you be good and condemn God? So many people, well, you know, how could God send anyone to hell? That's so terrible. You ever seen what people do? <laughs> Has God ever done anything evil like people do? No. Does anyone have a choice about their condemnation? Everyone has a choice. Did you notice the vernacular? Did you notice the wording? Jesus said, I came not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Who does God want to be free from condemnation? The world. Every person alive. Every person alive. Now, do you tell me that? Is that an evil God that wants every person to be free from condemnation? It's not evil, is He? God's good. And Jesus here is talking about His own death on the cross. He's talking about God judging Him in the place of you and in the place of me so that we can know that we're saved. Now, all I want to do is I want to make one point. I want to give you some supporting Scripture. If you take notes in your Bible, I recommend just jotting these verses that we're going to look at. There are a lot more in the Bible that will help with the same thing, but jotting these verses that we're going to look at from the Gospel of John next to John 3 and verse 18 because they'll always help you to know that you're saved. It's good to know something for sure, isn't it? Yes. So the Bible says here, He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth is not condemned. Now here's something practical. You don't have to do this in your Bible, but some people do. Some people just cross out the pronoun and make it personal. You know that the difference between a personal noun and a pronoun is, right? A pronoun is a nonspecific noun that can fit a person, but a personal pronoun is your name. And so you could put your name there, and you could put... For me, it would be Ryan. Ryan Matthew Price. Great name, huh? Uh, my parents are brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Ryan Matthew Price that believeth. I've believed in Jesus. I have looked to the cross of Jesus, not to my good works, not to anything else, but I've looked to the Jesus and the death on the cross for my salvation. And the Bible says, is not condemned. Now, I appreciate the use of the tense there. What tense is is? Present. It's present tense. So let me ask you a question. Am I, if I've believed, and I, I've put my name there, am I presently condemned? No. I'm presently not condemned. Now here's a little nugget for you that I hope you'll help to make practical. You don't get eternal life when you die and go to heaven. You get eternal life when you believe and you'll never die. Amen. That's a great truth. See, the word for death in the Bible is a word that means separation. And uh, truly, death, separation means a number of things. But death, certainly, the kind of death where Adam, when he sinned, and again, God said, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die. Did Adam die the day he ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. Yeah, he did. He did. See, it used to be that up until that time, God walked with Adam in the garden and in the cool of day, and they were face to face, and there was nothing between God and Adam. But when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God no longer walked with Adam. They were separated, and Adam was spiritually dead to God. Dead being what? Separated from God. Mm -hmm. So Adam, because he sinned, was dead to God. And when you're born, my friend, you're not alive spiritually. That's why we saw last week the importance of spiritual birth. Now, you may be spiritual. Everybody is. You may be aware of spiritual things. You may be interested in God, but until you've received Jesus as your Savior, you're not born spiritually. That's a birth. That's a choice. Your physical birth, you had no choice of. But your spiritual birth, you choose. And you say, I believe in Jesus. I want God to be my Savior, my Father, 
and I want Jesus to be my Savior. And you're born by choice, but you're dead when you're born spiritually. You're born spiritually, I'm sorry, you're dead when you're born physically, but you're born spiritually when you receive Jesus as your Savior. How do you receive Jesus? Well, we saw last week by believing. By saying, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. That's as simple as that, right? Uh, to be healed by the when you were bitten by a serpent, you looked. And to receive Jesus as your Savior, you asked, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. Amen. So now put your name there. He or your name that believeth. The Bible says, present tense, is not condemned. Man, that's a great truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I get a lot of calls from people around the world. It's, it's funny, it's interesting. We have probably a hundred times more people watch our church online than, than actually come here in person. Probably more than a hundred times. You know, we do have videos that just have thousands and thousands of views. But I have almost every week people contact me, people call. When I, I, get, I get phone calls every week uh, from phone numbers that I don't know and I answer them on my cell phone. And a lot of times people are asking the question about, I don't know if I have eternal life. How can I know? There's a dear friend of our church that uh, he lives in Iowa and uh, several of you have talked to him on the phone. He's probably going to move here someday and come here. But he used to call me, call me for a couple of years. And he used to say, you know, I'm just, I, I want to be saved. I've, I've prayed to be saved, but I don't know that I am saved. And I've had him just read this verse with his name in it. He used to just call and say, you know, I'm just really feeling uncertain right now. And so he'd read his name. This person, I'm going to tell you his name, that believeth is not condemned. But he, I said, is that you? Have you believed? Have you believed in Jesus? Well, God's Word, God's Son. Who's speaking here? This is Jesus. Jesus said, if you've believed, you are not condemned. Is not condemned. It's not a matter of when you get to heaven, you'll find out. No, right now, you're, you have eternal life. And it says, he that believeth not is condemned already. And somebody read that last phrase aloud for me, would you please? Because he hath not believed. Because he hath not believed. How does a person get to be condemned? Rejecting Jesus. By not believing. I, now you say, Pastor, now believe. Well, what if they just don't, what if they just can't, you know, really wrap their mind around whether or not he was the Son of God or not? You know, that isn't believing. What if they're just not convinced <clears throat> that Jesus is the Son of God. That isn't what believing is. See, believing is making a choice. You say, Pastor, oh, that's a far stretch. No, believing at a certain point is saying, I choose to believe something. Uh, you say, Pastor, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a realist. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know people that can do that? Has anyone ever believed something about you that wasn't true, good or bad? Have they? Has anybody just ever thought something about you and refused to, to believe anything otherwise? I think all of us have had that happen. Isn't there anything more frustrating than somebody choosing to believe something or someone choosing not to believe something and it's just an arbitrary choice? Facts can be presented to them and facts don't matter. Now listen to me for a second, would you please? Search the facts. Search the facts. You'll see Jesus was God. That's what Nicodemus is saying when he came to Jesus. He said, no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. Raising the dead, giving the blind their sight, the lepers being healed, the deaf being healed, the lame being healed. The things that Jesus did prove beyond shadow of doubt that he's God. You say, Pastor, but we're not living in that day and age. No, but fortunately we've got a book that's inspired by God and tells you about it. And secondly, you can, you can check with history. And you'll see corroborated that Jesus did miracles that only God could do. And if you want to believe, you can. Believe's a choice. You know, people are motivated to believe or not believe. But the reason people choose not to believe is because they don't want to have eternal life. Or because they don't want to have to bow to God or have God interfere in their life. But unbelief is a choice just like belief is. And a person who's condemned has chosen not to believe. Does the Bible say that anywhere else? Well, the Gospel of John, which helps us to know this, says it in several places. Will you go to John chapter 5 and look at verse 24, please? John chapter 5 and verse 24. This is Jesus speaking again here. And He says plainly, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth My word. Now, how many of us is this? How many of us qualify, He that heareth My word? You're hearing it right now. 
He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, that's God, hath everlasting life. Now let's just analyze those two words, half and everlasting. What's the word half? What tense is half? Present. Present tense. In other words, you won't someday get everlasting life. If you've heard the word and you've believed in God, you have it. Half everlasting life. So again, this is another place where you could write your name in. Where that pronoun that says, he that believeth, well, if you are a he that believeth, you can write your name in. And just put, Charlie hath everlasting life. Tony hath everlasting life. John the Baptist hath everlasting life. Keith hath everlasting life. And you just call out somebody's name and put it there. If you believed on God, and Jesus said, you believed on Him that sent me, you already have everlasting life. And He goes on further to qualify and said, and shall not... Uh, come into condemnation. Now, I appreciate the use of the tense. Shall. Shall. You ever read legalese? You ever write legalese? Well, something says shall. Uh, why is it that attorneys like to use the word shall? It's imperative. <laughs> it's an imperative. It means it's a requirement. Okay? So when, uh, when an attorney writes into a contract, I have a brother-in-law who's an attorney, and I'm surprised he doesn't talk and say shall. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> But uh, the reality of it is that when somebody says shall, it is a requirement. In other words, it is, it is contractually holding, and it is conditional as well, isn't it? If this, then this shall be. You know, and what's the condition here? Ooh. Believing. If a person believes half, you already have eternal life, and shall not come into condemnation. Well, those are good words in a court of law, aren't they? Well, let me just show you the document. It says, shall not come into condemnation, judge, and a fair, uh, a fair judge would say, okay, well then according to the law, you have eternal life. Is God a fair judge? Who gave us this promise? God did, right? God's Son gave us this promise. And the Bible says, he that believeth... Uh, the Bible says, hath everlasting life. That's what it says here. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. But then the present tense again is passed from death unto life. Born dead, but when you believe, you're alive. That's the word of God, the promise mm -hmm. on you. Believe the Bible? Can anyone know for sure, according to the word of God, that they have eternal life? Sure. Yes, you can. How can you know? You believe. And that's God's Word on it. Uh, now, you say, Pastor, well, I just don't know if I believe the Bible. Let me challenge you for a second. Let me challenge you for a second. Okay, if you won't believe the Bible, what do you prefer for an authority instead? If you'd rather believe something else, would you like to trust a human witness? You know, you can get any human witness to perjure themselves. You can get me to perjure myself easily just because of my poor memory. <laughs> I tell you, it wouldn't be difficult at all. I can't even remember things. And so I could tell you something and not remember telling it. Brother John, I did this to you, didn't I? He, Brother John had a party uh, for Aunt T at his house and he asked me to bring ice. <laughs> remember this? Did I bring the ice? No. He said, I'll just get the ice right now. I pulled up and I'm looking at him like a deer in the headlights. Did I tell you I'd bring ice? Yeah, you said you'd bring ice. You know, there are several people that were witnesses to that, and I don't remember it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we we're in time to get ice. But, you know, that's, that's me and my memory. You want to trust me? You want me to be your authority? I'm not trying to be mean right now, but have you noticed uh, that the Pope is changing the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, there were some pretty clear lines, weren't there? My, my aunt, who for years has been a devout, uh, involved Catholic, told me this a couple of years ago. She said, you know, this Pope, I just don't know about him. She said, because he's changing everything. You know, it used to be that this kind of uh, perversion was sin. And now this Pope says, well, not so much. Today, we don't know what the position is on homosexuality, abortion, or um, 
I mean, just, just a lot of different issues. Isn't it true? I mean, so it's an it's a evolving position. Now, let me ask you a question. A couple of popes ago, did we know? Did we have clarity about that? Mm-hmm. What's changed, God or man? God hasn't changed, has He? Okay, so if you're going to look to an institution like a Baptist church or a Catholic church or a Presbyterian church or a Mormon church, or you're going to look to a religion, my friend, all it takes is for leadership changing to change what the religion believes. Look at Mormonism today. In some areas of Utah and so forth, Mormons believe what Joseph Smith did, but nowhere else. Right? Plundering, killing people. The Mormon church doesn't like openly declare that to be an option. If they're not Mormon, you can kill them and plunder them. You don't see Mormons doing that very much right now, do you? And if you were to state that, but you know Joseph Smith taught that and believed that, Brigham Young taught that and believed it, what's changed? Polygamy. It's, it's good, it's right. What's changed? Well, God hasn't changed. So if those individuals speak for God then can I say to you that it would be impossible for them to speak for an unchanging God because God hasn't changed. And I just want to tell you something. If you won't receive the Word of God as your authority, can I help you? You're not going to be able to know anything for sure. But the Bible is God's Word. And it is our authority. And the Bible says that a person that believes half, already has, eternal life. Now let me ask you a question. Is that good or bad? Is that positive or negative? You say, Pastor, it just seems so negative talking about. No, we're talking about not being in condemnation. We're talking about God's way to not be condemned. And it's just amazing how we can just stray from the obvious truth and go off on a tangent and believe something nutty about God. I've had people say, you know, I just don't believe that a good God could send people to hell. Well, a person who's condemned and God's enemy has condemned themselves. Whose choice is condemnation? Yours or God's? It's your choice. Because God's given Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Okay, I want to look at uh, like one or two more verses. Uh, John chapter um, 6, and let's look at verse down at verse 47. This is Jesus. <coughs> Again, you can read for context. We'll be there in a few weeks. But Jesus says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, that means true, truly, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me, what's the next phrase? Hath everlasting life. Okay, so how does a person have everlasting life? Believing in Jesus. Okay, it's not too hard to understand, is it? John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And let's go down to verse... uh, (coughs) Uh, let's see here, 24 and 25. Um, then, um, I'm, let's yeah, let's read down to verse 29. Verse chapter 10, verse 24 to 29. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So here are people who have seen Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead. And they said, tell us plainly whether you be the Son of God. And Jesus said, I told you, and the works that I do proved it. If you don't believe, why is it you don't believe? You don't want to. You don't want to. It's a choice, right? Okay. Then verse 26, he said, but you believe not because you're not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then notice verse 28 and 29, which we wanted to get to. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall... Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. <clears throat> my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And here we're told that believing is the way to know that we have eternal life. And we're also told the way that eternal life is guaranteed. And that's what Jesus said. Nobody can take it from you because I'm the one that's got you. Last week we saw the that no person has been to heaven. And so no person knows where it is. And so it's nuts to think that you could die and figure out how to get there. You don't go on vacation like that, do you? 
you ever go to Hawaii and you're like, you know, I'm going to go on such and such a date and you take off work and you get in your car and leave and head? Where do you head if you're going to get in your car and leave to go to Hawaii? You head to the airport, right? If you don't have an airplane get you there, if you don't have a boat to get you there, you're not driving to Hawaii. It's not happening. First of all, you've got to know where it is and you've got to have a way to get there. And friend, nobody knows where God is. He's beyond the heavens. And if you think you're just going to die and then you're going to navigate your way there to God, my friend, you'll be wandering in the spirit world for a long time. I'm being sarcastic. Not really. You're condemned. You die condemned. But if you die believing in Jesus, Jesus is the one that gets you there. He knows where heaven is and He knows how to get you there. And He's the one that says, if you believe, you're in My hands. And He said, My Father is greater than Me. And He said, No man's able to pluck them out of My Father's hands. You're in God's hands. Now, I love the Allstate hands. It's a good commercial, right? You're in good hands with Allstate. But the fact of the matter is you're in good hands with Jesus. He's the only perfect person who's ever lived. He's the only person who has the authority to promise you eternal life. And He says, if you believe in Me, you have eternal life. And He said, you will never perish. And He said, no man can pluck you out of My hands. He said, nobody can take your eternal life from you. Now let me ask you a question on the authority of Scripture today from what we've seen. Does God want you to confidently know that you have eternal life? Yes, He does. John's Gospel is written why? that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. And I want to ask you again the question, does God want you to know you have eternal life? Yes, so much so that He sent His perfect Son to die for sin. And Jesus never sinned. To be lifted up on a cross. And if you look to that cross of Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, my friend, then God says, you are a hather. <laughs> that is, you have eternal life. And eternal is forever. And Jesus said, and it's guaranteed on the basis of my ability to keep you. He said, no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. You can't do something yourself to cause, your, cause yourself to lose eternal life. You can't be lost. A person who's saved can't be lost. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you today, just these few verses, there are many more in the Scripture, but these verses in a passage of Scripture, it's, trying, it's just trying to help you to believe and know that you have life in His name Know these verses. Know what God says. And the next time you start wondering, you know what, I'm a sinner and I don't deserve to go to heaven. I'm a terrible person. What's going to happen to me when I die? Well, the, the question simply is, have I believed? Yes, well then what's God say? You know what God says is going to happen to you? God says that you have eternal life. That's what God says. Well, what if something happens? What if I really mess up? What if I make a mistake? What if somebody does something to me and I respond to it? You know what God says? No man's able to pluck them out of my hand. God says, it's not dependent on you, it's dependent on me. And if you believed, you've got it. You've got eternal life. Now let me just ask you a question. Do you have eternal life? Do you have eternal life? I hope you do. If you don't, you know how to have it? Look to Jesus and ask. Here's what I did. A child can do it. Jesus said that you have to come to Him like a child. And, you know, a child doesn't understand everything, but they can be pretty profound and simple, can't they, in understanding when I was a child, I understood this truth, and I just, I prayed like this. It wasn't these exact words, but I prayed and asked God. I said, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I need Jesus. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. My dad tells about when, when he was born again, the Spirit of God came in him. He just, he just cried out and said, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Now, friend, do you have those kind of words? From your heart, could you, could you cry out to Jesus and say, God, I want eternal life. I want Jesus. I want to be saved. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I know all the Bible. No, you can learn the Bible, but you don't have to know all the Bible to be saved. You have to believe the Bible is the Word of God and you have to believe what it says about Jesus. Amen. That's it. That's all there is to it. And anybody here could do that. You say, Pastor, not me. I can't believe that. No, yes, you could. It's a choice. It's a choice of the will. Would you believe in Jesus? Father, thank you for what we've learned today. And I pray that you'd help us to believe it. We pray in Jesus' name. Before I finish my prayer, I want to just ask everyone for just a minute to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We're not going to have a come forward invitation today. Uh, there's not a lot of decisions for most people here to make. But I want to ask a question in privacy. And so I'd ask that you close your eyes and not look around because every person here would like to have privacy. And uh, I would be the only person in the room with my eyes open. But if you were to say today, Pastor Price... 
Uh, you know, God's working in my heart. All right? God showed me something here today. And one of the things that I saw from the Word of God today is that it appears that the Bible says it's easy to be saved or to have eternal life, but it's still not something that I've internalized or personalized. I'm not sure I have eternal life. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But would you just pray for me because God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life. Would you just slip your hand up. Just say, just say, pray for me because God's dealing with me about the matter of eternal life. Okay? All right? Here's a second question. You're here this today and you'd say, Pastor, <clears throat> pray for me because what the Bible says is true, but I've lacked assurance. <laughs> I, I know what the Bible says about receiving Jesus. I believe it's true. I believe the Bible but oftentimes I've questioned whether I'm really saved and I've based it on what I do instead of what Jesus has done. Would you pray that God would help me to believe His Word when the Bible says in John 3 and John 5 and John 6 and John 6 that believing is the way that we can know that we have eternal life. Would you pray that God would help me with assurance? Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's a question I have. Pray for me about assurance. Anyone else? Just slip your hand right up, okay? Okay, now, if you're asking me to pray for that, I think we could ask God to pray for the same thing, couldn't we, as well? So, Father, I pray that you would be with each of us and help us to take you at your word. God, for anyone who would have question or doubt regarding <coughs> what you say for eternal life, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the distinction of Gospels that tell who Jesus is and Gospels that tell how to believe in Jesus so that we would know that we have eternal life. We thank you for what, you, what you've taught us here today. And I ask that you just increase this truth, allow it to sink in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your great attention this morning. You're dismissed. <laughs>